What did Jesus really says part 2? Chapter 1, Christian-Muslim Dialogue Christians believe that Jesus, peace be upon him, came to teach all of mankind the religion of God and to show them the path to guidance. All mankind is therefore required to follow his message and only those who believe in the crucifixion and the redemption will be saved. They believe that the Jews are also required to convert to Christianity because they are the most qualified to recognize the word of God and the signs of Jesus to be found in their own book. The Jews, on the other hand, tell us that Jesus was not a messenger of God, but rather a false prophet, a sorcerer, an offspring of adulterers, and many other allegations. They claim that there are no prophecies of Jesus in their book and that he was not the promised Messiah Christ, anointed one. Their Messiah is yet to come. For this reason, they claim that they are not required by God to follow Jesus. Muslims believe in both Moses and Jesus, peace be upon him, as prophets of God. They believe that both Moses and Jesus as well as Noah, Abraham, Jacob, and all of the other prophets of God were all truthful messengers as well as faithful and faultless servants of God, Allah, Almighty. They also believe in the miracles of Jesus and his miraculous birth. Muslims believe that each time a messenger of God would pass away, mankind would begin to slowly fall back upon their evil deeds until they had managed to corrupt his original message. When this would happen, God Almighty would send a new prophet to renew his original message to these people and return them to the straight path. In this manner, the true message of God would always be available to all those who searched for it until the day of judgment. This can be seen in the Bible in such verses as Matthew 5 verses 17-18 we read, Think not that I am come to destroy the law, or the prophets, I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. The Jews know God as Elohim or Yahweh. The Christians know him as God, or Father, or Jehovah, etc. Muslims know him as Allah, and more than 99 other venerable names. Muslims believe that Allah Almighty did not send down many messages to mankind but only one. The religion of the submission to his will, the uniqueness of himself, and the fact that he is the only one worthy of worship. The details of the religion were molded to sweet each individual people, but the message was one message, God is one. Worship him alone. This is made apparent in the verse of Al Imran, 384 which states that which means, Say, O Messenger, that you have faith in Allah, doing as he instructs you, and that you have faith in the revelation that was given to you, and to Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, and Jacob. And in what was revealed to the prophets among Jacob's descendants, and in the scriptures and miracles that were given to Moses, Jesus, and all the prophets by their Lord. Also, say that you make no distinction between them, believing in all of them, and that you are bound to Allah alone, surrendering in devotion to him. Also, in El Nisa, 136 we read that which means O believers, be firm in your faith in Allah, his messenger, the Quran which he revealed to his messenger and the books he revealed to the messengers before him. Anyone who disbelieves in Allah, his angels, his books, his messengers and the day of judgment has strayed far from the straight path. Muslims are told in the Quran that the unscrupulous few had managed to pervert the words of God Almighty sent down to Jesus, peace be upon him, and the previous prophets after the passing of their prophets. The masses were then misled by what was claimed to be 100% the inspiration of God. The changes made by these people have resulted in countless contradictions between the verses. As we shall see, these contradictions and changes have been well recognized and documented in the West for centuries now. However, many of their apologists claim that these people were well-meaning and were only trying to clarify that which was obscure and so forth when they changed the word of God, see chapter 2. Whatever their motives, these apologists conveniently forget the command of Deuteronomy 4. To ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it. That ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God. The liberties mankind has taken with God's previous scriptures are the reason God sent down the Quran as his last message to mankind and took it upon himself this time to preserve it for all time. From Corruption or Modification Professor Arthur J. Arbery writes Apart from certain orthographical modifications of the originally somewhat primitive method of writing, intended to render unambiguous and easy the task of reading the recitation. The Quran, Quran, as printed in the 20th century is identical with the Quran as authorized by Uthman more than 1,300 years ago. On the other hand, Mr. C. G. Tucker says in the history of the Christians in the light of modern knowledge page 320. 
Thus Gospels were produced which clearly reflected the conception of the practical needs of the community for which they were written. In them the traditional material was used, but there was no hesitation in altering it or making additions to it, or in leaving out what did not serve the writer's purpose. Mr. C. J. Cadu has the following to say in his book, The Life of Jesus. In the four Gospels, therefore, the main documents to which we must go if we are to fill out at all that bare sketch which we can put together from other sources. We find material of widely differing quality as regards credibility. So far-reaching is the element of uncertainty that it is tempting to down tools at once and to declare the task hopeless. The historical inconsistencies and improbabilities in parts of the Gospels form some of the arguments advanced in favor of the Christ myth theory. These are, however, entirely outweighed as we have shown by other considerations. Still the discrepancies and uncertainties that remain are serious and consequently many moderns who have no doubt whatever of Jesus' real existence. Regard as hopeless any attempt to dissolve out of the historically true from the legendary or mythical matter which the Gospels contain. And to reconstruct the story of Jesus' mission out of the more historical residue. Professor J. R. Drumlow says in Commentary on the Holy Bible, page 16, a copyist would sometimes put in not what was in the text, but what he thought ought to be in it. He would trust a fickle memory, or he would make the text accord with the views of the school to which he belonged. In addition to the versions and quotations from the Christian fathers, nearly 4,000 Greek MSS of the Testament were known to exist. As a result, the variety of reading is considerable. Before this book was written, I had published a series of articles in a local publication which had been progressing slowly from exhibiting some of the more minor examples of human modification of the Bible. Such as the fact that the authors of the Bible are not who they claim to be, and had been working up to more fundamental issues. One of our readers, whom we shall henceforth refer to only as Mr. J, asked us to publish his viewpoint in our publication. Unlike this lowly author, Mr. J, is a professional Christian in the sense that preaching Christianity is his job. He is a very devout Christian. He also has a history of strong evangelical activity. Mr. J made himself known to us through written letters to us, calls to our Muslim chaplain, and his appearance before us on other occasions wherein he called upon us to believe in Jesus, peace be upon him, and to accept his sacrifice, some of this long before we started our series of articles. We have since come to know each other quite well and have managed to remain friendly and outgoing towards one another even with our differing beliefs. However, the fact that this author is not a professional religious person or a professional preacher, but rather a simple graduate science student, has made it necessary to schedule these matters around other more immediate scholarly concerns. It was first and foremost the will of Allah, then the continuous evangelical activity of Mr. J, and his claims against Islam which forced me to step up my research of the Bible and publish this book. I therefore thank Allah Almighty that he sent Mr. J, to me, as a blessing in disguise. Mr. J believes that the examples presented do not affect the founding beliefs of Christianity and had provided us with literature by men such as Mr. F. F. Bruce stating such things as. Does it matter whether the New Testament documents are reliable or not? Is it so very important that we should be able to accept them as truly historical records, and also doubt the story of Jesus as it has come down to us may be myth or legend? But the teaching ascribed to him whether he was actually responsible for it or not has a value all its own, and so forth. Muslims know for a fact that Jesus, peace be upon him, was neither a myth nor a legend but a true prophet of God, but we do feel that an inspired book of God should contain no contradictions. Historical or otherwise. For this reason we do not believe that his book has reached us as it was originally submitted by him. Mr. J believes that such matters as knowing the true authors of the books of the Bible are not crucial to a Christian's faith and has challenged us to prove that a Christian's basic faith is at all in error. In compliance with his request, we sent him four very brief questions concerning the founding beliefs of Christianity. We asked him to provide us with carefully researched and weighed answers to these questions. They were 1. Is there a trinity? If so then please present us with as many biblical references as you possibly can and briefly explain its fundamental concept. 2. Is the great and faithful messenger of Allah, Jesus the son of Mary, peace be upon them both, the physical, begotten sired, etc. Son of Allah, or not? If he is, then give us as many biblical references as you possibly can. If not then why does the majority of Christendom believe that he is the physical begotten sired son of Allah? 
3. Did Jesus, peace be upon him, himself ever say in the Bible I am a God, or worship me? If so then give us as many biblical references as possible. If not, then why does the majority of Christendom believe that he is a God, not a mortal, and the Son of God? Jesus is invoked daily as God to forgive sins, cast out devils, and generally sought after in prayer. Upon whose authority do Christians believe that Jesus is God? Jesus or others? Give as many references as possible. For, if it can be proven, through the Bible, that Jesus, peace be upon him, is not God, nor the physical begotten sired Son of God, neither is there any Trinity. Then will this prove that the unscrupulous few have corrupted the Word of God or not? What we were looking for was not flowery sermons on belief and blind faith, but only plain vanilla proof from the Bible itself that Christ, peace be upon him, himself ever had anything to do with the current beliefs of Christianity. Muslims believe that Jesus was one of the most pious and elect messengers of God Almighty for all time. However, they do not believe that he is himself a God, the physical Son of God, nor do they believe in a trinity, but only in the uniqueness of God Almighty. That he is the only God in existence and the only being worthy of worship. Muslims also do not believe in an original sin or an atonement but believe that an individual's actions are the only things that will decide his final abode, either in heaven or in hell. This is the reason why God Almighty sent Muhammad, in order to rectify these misconceptions which have crept into his previous message. We can find no more fundamental differences between Islam and Christianity than these. Mr. J's response follows. One point one Christian perspective. It is my great privilege and pleasure to have been invited to address the readers of this publication on some of the most important distinctions between Christianity and Islam. For questions have been proposed as a means of clarifying the biblical perspective in relation to the series of articles on Jesus and Christianity that appeared last semester. As I see it, all four questions essentially come together in one basic question, who is Jesus? The answer to that question, and the heart of the message that has been proclaimed by followers of Jesus since his advent, is that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John 20 verse 31. Addressing each of these questions may now help clarify this historic Christian conviction. 1. Is there a trinity? The biblical teaching of God's essential nature, summarized in the word trinity, rests largely on our understanding of the identity of Jesus. A question I will take up in some length under question number 3. At this point, perhaps a demonstration that the terminology for the doctrine of the Trinity is found throughout the New Testament. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 28 verse 19. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all men. 1 Corinthians 12 verses 4-6 May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. 2 Corinthians 13 verse 14 But you, dear friends, build yourselves up in your most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Jude 20-21 The doctrine of the Trinity is perhaps best understood in terms of Christian salvation. Christian believe that God the Father wills that we be reconciled to Him from sin, and that He sent the Son, who in His perfect life and substitutionary death provides the basis of that reconciliation, and that the Father now, in Jesus' name, sends the Holy Spirit, who applies the salvation of Jesus to the Christian believers, thus saving them and empowering them to live lives of victory over sin. Thus is the Christian's experience and assurance of salvation in terms of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yet they absolutely believe that there is only one God. How do we put this together? This is where the word Trinity comes in. It expresses this truth about God as it is found in the Bible. This is certainly not an exhaustive explanation, but it may help to demonstrate the significance of the doctrine in practical Christian life. 2. Is Jesus the physical, begotten sired, Son of God? Jesus is presented in the New Testament as the Son of God by virtue of his unique eternal relationship with the Father and by means of his unique virgin birth. We need to understand, then, how Jesus is the Son of God. 
the New Testament tells us how. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about, his mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph her husband was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Matthew 1 verses 18 to 21 The question as stated implies that Jesus is somehow the result of a physical union between God and Mary, but this is not at all the case. Jesus' birth is a miraculous event through the agency of the Holy Spirit. Thus the Son's deity is incarnated, or made flesh, in this Jesus is the God-man. Begotten is the old English word that, while in human terms means to have a child, the emphasis even there is that what a human father begets shares in the essential nature of that father. It is in this sense that the King James translates the Greek word monogenes as begotten, Jesus shares the essential nature of the father, but rather through some physical act, but a supernatural one. 3. Did Jesus himself ever say in the Bible I am God, or worship me? What makes Jesus stand out from all other religious figures is the nature of his claims about himself. He claims the prerogatives of God, the rightful object of a person's supreme allegiance, and receives without censure the worship and obedience of those who believe. A number of examples may help to illustrate this. A. Forgiveness of sins. In Mark 2 verses 1 to 12, we read the account of Jesus healing a crippled man. What is so surprising, and so shocking to his original audience, is the statement that Jesus makes before healing the man. As Jesus sees a group of men bring the paralytic to him, Mark records the scene. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there, thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts, and he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up, take your mat and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I tell you, Get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat and walked out in full view of them all. B. Titles Jesus in the Gospels appropriates two significant titles throughout his ministry. 1. The Son of Man This is the title that Jesus himself uses most frequently. It is a messianic title derived from the Old Testament book of Daniel. When we read the passage in Daniel, the implicit claim that Jesus is making about himself becomes apparent. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He, the Son of Man, was given authority, glory and sovereign power, all peoples, nations and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Daniel 7 verses 13 to 14 2. The Son of God At his trial Jesus affirmed this title, again the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, said Jesus. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Mark 14 verses 61 to 63. See Jesus' direct claims. At the climax of a lengthy argument, Jesus speaks of himself, Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. You are not yet fifty years old, the Jews said to him, and you have seen Abraham. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. Add this. They picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. John 8 verses 56-59 The shock of this claim are those two words I am. It is the same designation that God used for himself in his call to Moses, God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. Exodus 3 verse 14 D. Jesus receives worship. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, and when he found him, Jesus said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? the man asked. 
tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, You have now seen him, in fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. John 9 verse 35 38 Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him. Matthew 28 verses 16 to 17 E. Jesus accepts divine entitlement. In what is a clear dialogue between Jesus and Doubting Thomas, we read, Then Jesus said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus held him, Because you have seen me, you have believed, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. John 20 verses 27 to 29. Does Jesus say, I am God? No, because that would have been misunderstood. Jesus is not the Father, as it would have been thought, Jesus is the Son. But he clearly claims an absolutely unique relationship with God whom Jesus calls Father. Jesus claims something about himself that, through the various miracles, his statements as cited above. And the response he receives from other people, is slowly filled out, and the meaning of his sonship becomes clear. In the very opening of his Gospel, the Apostle John presents Jesus as the Word and provides perhaps the clearest explanation of the identity of Jesus, the meaning of the Incarnation, and a further glimpse into the reality of the Trinity. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made, without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John 1 verse 1 4, 14 For, if it can be proven, through the Bible, that Jesus is not God, nor the physical begotten sired Son of God, neither is there any trinity. Then will this prove that the unscrupulous few have corrupted the Word of God? The Christian message about Jesus revolves around three facts, the Incarnation, the Crucifixion, and the Resurrection. Proof from the Bible or otherwise that any one of these three things are not true, and like a three-legged stool the truth of the message would collapse. Most proofs against the traditional teachings of Christianity consist of pitting one passage of Scripture against another, and almost always taking such passages out of context. Context, I believe, always vindicates the understanding of God and of Jesus as I have here tried to briefly present. I would conclude, then, with an encouragement for the readers to read the Bible, particularly one of the Gospels, for themselves. There, I believe, the words and works of Jesus would provide a most convincing reason to embrace Him as Lord and Savior, and find in Him the spiritual satisfaction that so many today seek after.